long programs for teams of family members to come to campus. This was of course pre-COVID and will hopefully resume by next fall, next September, where families can come to the classroom uh, as a group, be among other families attending a one week program on, on uh, a variety of topics, but divided so far in, in the following ways. A one week program for at families uh, who are later generation, generation two going to three, going to four, going to seven, later generation families, where the dynamics and the enterprise um, are typically later generation topics, issues, because of the complexity of the system. The family has evolved in a more complex way. The enterprise typically has gotten larger and is more complex. And those issues of complexity, as well as later family relationships and a longer history, uh, affect the kinds of topics, the kinds of issues we talk about. Then there, of course, the this is the predominant form of family business. Those companies that are at the founder stage, and we look in this next week uh, at companies that are going from founder into the next generation and all of the topics related to that very complex transition. And then a, uh, a new program that I'm working on with my faculty colleague, Jason Jay, uh, called Owning Impact. And this is a program for, again, teams of family members, and you'd, you'd be among other teams of family members, uh, looking at how you develop a strategy, get organized, build momentum for your family to engage in what we call family social impact activities. Could be family or corporate philanthropy. Those are more traditional ways of giving back, engaging with your community and environment. It could be impact investing. It could be uh, social entrepreneurship. It could be um, uh, using your family connections or company profile to influence government or influence other families or other companies to join you in certain efforts. A lot of paths, a lot of channels to do this important work, but then how do you create a strategy, a comprehensive strategy where you can make better use of your resources, your aspirations, your connections, your networks to do important work for society. MIT um, has a long history of encouraging corporate social responsibility and uh, progressive social action uh, in general in the world. And our program, which, which we believe at this point is a step or two ahead in this um, important topic area will uh, help to cement MIT's uh, positioning as a place to come to learn about this important, uh, important work. So I'm proud, very proud to be part of the MIT faculty and to be doing what I'm, I think my most advanced work out of, uh, I've been in this field for over 40 years. And the work that I've been doing since arriving at MIT, I think is, um, has really been uh, the best work I've done. So at the master's level, so far my activities at the master's level have, have been to uh, speak at uh, short sessions that the Family Business Club organizes. In the spring, or sorry, in the fall of 2021, or in the spring of 2022, I hope to have in place a master's level course that deals with the topic uh, at, at the master student interest level of family business or family enterprise management. So let me explain a bit what that means. Uh, I could have broken this down into 20 topics or condensed it down to seven 
but a convenient list of topics are listed here. These 10 topics describe much of what we would be talking about in either a semester long or half semester long course. Uh, and it looks at how these, how family business systems or family enterprise systems, which I'll explain, uh, behave. What are their typical issues, strengths, complications, vulnerabilities, and how do they perform vis-a-vis -vis other forms of enterprise? Uh, how do they develop over time? Uh, if you are in one of these, uh, how do you make the choice to go in what are typical paths of career development? What are, some, what, is, uh, what are some of the lessons we've learned about how to do it right? How do you work with a relative? How do you own things with a relative? How do you manage the complicated management, leadership, ownership, family issues when you're transitioning from one generation to another? typically lumped under the convenient label of succession. Um, how do you govern these things? I'll say a little bit about that. Um, if you have a family office, a relatively new but quickly growing, very popular form of family enterprise organization that attempts to provide support to the family in various ways and typically look, look out over, guide, manage even the investing that takes place outside the operating businesses. Uh, the important topic of family social impact. And then how do we think about in a capstone way, family success over generations? A lot to cover, but in these 40 years, I've learned a lot by being in the trenches with families all over the world. I've worked now in over 70 countries and uh, in any, gosh, last week, but on Zoom, I was on four continents uh, working with families on their particular issues, supported by an organization that I created in 1989, uh, filled with uh, great interdisciplinary colleagues who help families in an exemplary way. And so I'm almost never alone now working with families, but on a team, but working on typical issues that, that I'll describe next. The family enterprise, you'll hear me use that term, is the collection of a family's uh, assets and activities that are meaningful to it in some way financial and beyond financial. And if you look at this, what some people refer to as a flower diagram or a petal diagram, you can see that typically there is a family operating company uh, at the top of this diagram, but families are interested in more and are supported by more assets and more activities uh, than just a family company. And the, the goal is to develop an enterprise and an enterprise organization that keeps the, the unity and the commitment of the family while also uh, generating the returns, financial and other ways that a family needs to not only be supported, but be proud of their activities. And like all of the diagrams, uh, figures that I'll show you, in our brief time together today, uh, this comes out of practice. This comes out of observing family enterprise systems over decades and figuring out, not surprisingly, that the collection of activities, the, the, the workings of the assets of the family need to be coordinated and hopefully driven by some compelling uh, sense of mission. What are we trying to accomplish as a family? And also guided by certain core values that become harder and harder to instill and regulate uh, as a family grows and becomes more diverse and disparate uh, over generations. 
And then there's the family business or what we call the family business system, the collection of the business organization, the ownership group, all companies, all business enterprises have owners, and then also the family that typically is in a controlling or exclusive ownership position and most often participates, most often leads the company that they own. These uh, three circles define any family business system and you would see these used a lot with the accompanying questions of what are the goals of each group? What are the goals of these three groups with your family and family business system? Uh, what do we expect and how, how do we need to manage interactions, behaviors, um, and performance in each of these three important areas. Uh, we can see that all three areas require, deserve attention and need to be disciplined. And family business management asks, how do you do that? Because obviously you don't manage a family the way you do a business, although some business leaders try to. And you need to make sure that family members know where the family boundary stops and the ownership boundary begins and what are the responsibilities and rights of an owner versus a family member versus an employee in the business. So we talk about those dynamics and how you regulate these systems, but also encourage alignment among these three areas so that they're all three pointed in the same way, are mutually supportive, and hopefully the system hangs together longer. Now, over time, family businesses go through, uh, and family enterprise systems more broadly, go through stages related to the stage that the family is in and also how ownership is divided. And a family, if the business or enterprise lasts long enough, will go from controlling owner, where one person or a married couple control the big decisions through ownership, uh, who gets employed, how are we going to use our capital, what, are our, what is our strategic direction. A controlling owner uh, has uh, legal and usually legitimate control over these important choices. In the next generation, you could stay at that in that form for gosh, generations, that's rare, but it happens, where you pass your ownership to one person or pass ownership control to one person. But typically after a generation, maybe two, a family goes into the sibling stage where brothers and or sisters together and usually pretty equally own and control uh, the organization. And after that, they go into the cousin stage. We would look at what are the particular characteristics of each of these stages? What do you need to manage well if you're going to not only survive that stage, but to be able to move successfully into the next one? Um, on the topic of career choice and career development, it used to be assumed, used to be, that this is always what we want. We want somebody that can take over the organization that has been created, <clears throat> lead it, not just strategically, but operationally, and be able to make the tough choices at the management level and maybe we'll have a board. And of course, there, are some, there could be other owners of the business, but this is what we're trying to develop. Someone like this guy, Alex Taylor, who is in the fourth generation of the Cox family business, a very uh, well-known, high-performing uh, cable, formerly newspaper, but now cable company that is doing other interesting uh, things as well. Uh, but we know that, especially in your generation, but also in others that preceded you, 
some people wanted to be entrepreneurs to create new ventures like this Brazilian guy who I know, Alex Berman, who was a terrific uh, entrepreneur and grew a company in the uh, shoe business, the footwear business, and then merged his company with his father's larger business and then became, was an entrepreneur and became a very successful, is a very successful intrapreneur as well today. And then you have these wonderful, uh, creative, dynamic leaders like Adriana Cisneros uh, in a Miami-based company uh, who ha has taken over as a third generation leader of her company, her family's business owned by her and her siblings. Uh, a, a business that she has expanded much as her father did in his generation into other lines of business and her particular gift, she's good at these other two areas as well, by the way, but her particular gift is what we call a portfolio builder. Someone who can seed new companies, find good people, apply enough capital, form good governance around it, guide it, direct it, support it, and grow wealth in that way. And she's brilliant at it. So there are, there are choices in careers now that weren't talked about and weren't favored in previous generations, but could be of interest to you. And we will get to all of these. We'll also understand, I've done considerable research on the millennial generation in business families and we'll talk about some of the special interests, special challenges of uh, a millennial in their business families and in business organizations. Um, we'll also look at the multiple roles that you would be in, in a family business. You're a family member, you're also an employee, you're also an owner, potentially an owner. So you, you would probably have two or three hats that you would wear, depending on how many of these roles you, you occupy. And what are the competing expectations? And what are some of the confusions that can result when you're wearing more than one hat, more, more than one role hat uh, in a system like this? But also what are some of the synergies that you get from being in various roles. Finally, and I won't, not to confuse you, but to introduce you to some of the complexity, in a family business system, you need governance, just like you need good management and good leadership. Good governance helps you regulate a system and make sure that you're focused on particular issues and that you have a disciplined approach to managing the family, for example. And we'll talk about the rudiments of family governance, again, learned uh, through the example of other families over decades and decades of work with them. And then, of course, on the corporate side, the ownership and business side, there's ownership and business level governance. And then, of course, you need to coordinate it, integrate it, make sure that it's talking to itself in various forms so that you can have integrated, well-coordinated, aligned policies and action. Now, at the heart of all the stuff that we would cover in a family business course, you have um, this understanding that family companies when compared to non-family companies, here's a non-family business. And if you look at the performance of a thousand, a hundred non-family businesses, you would see that there are some high performers, low performers, and a bunch in the middle. And if we compare that sample to a family business sample of companies, you would get this interesting comparison. And this has been demonstrated in scores of uh, useful research that since the 
early 2000s that demonstrates that on average, a family business on average, they're better and worse ones, but on average, the family businesses perform better than non-family businesses. And we will take a look at why that's true. Now it's true as an average, but averages can be useful to look at understanding that you're, you wanna be at the high end of performance, whether you're a family business or non-family business, and we'll take a look at those as well. And just because on average family companies do better, some do worse and worse than family businesses. So, but what are the particular elements of performance, the drivers of performance that are encouraging not only better than average performance, but high performance? Historically, this has been what it's been about. That we know that looking at family companies, they typically do better in a uh, gradually changing environment. Includes, in, that includes business cycles. Family companies do better than non-family companies going through economic cycles. And what have they done that has tended to make them better historical performers? Well, they focus better, apparently, on op being operationally excellent and steadily improving, innovating on processes and products. Family companies are in the literature, my literature, uh, have been shown to be much better innovators. They also take a long-term view. They cultivate loyal stakeholder relationships with employees, with suppliers, with customers, with others, their communities. Uh, they have less debt. They have more financial stability to rely on as family companies do this. And typically they've grown within their industry. So stability, reliability, steady improvement, that's been the name of the game and they've used it and they've done better. But this is also true about family companies that if you take a hundred that survive one generation, by the end of the second generation, you're down to about 30. This, this graph, this curve varies, I'm sure, between industries, among countries, but it's largely the same no matter where you go. Um, by the end of the third genera uh, generation, we're down to about 15 of the original 100 and then down to about 10 by the time you get to the fourth generation, if you survive that long. So why? Well, why do, we, why do family companies lose it? Could be any number of reasons. But one of the things that I have focused on uh, a lot more in the last several years, 10 years, 15 years, is how family companies change and adapt over time. And two of the things that take a lot of family companies out of the game are the fact that the industry matures, you need to get better, bigger and better and more cost effective to continue to, to survive in the industry and a lot of family companies don't. They're good at playing the game within their industry. They're not good at migrating outside of their industry to better opportunities that allow them to continue to play the game, although in another arena. Family companies, in my view, and in the view of the literature, they're not good at it as I think these numbers suggest. We also know if you take a look at the performance of families, not companies, that families that make it in terms of becoming wealthy, either very high, moderate, or reasonable levels of wealth uh, tend to lose it over time. 
I think that about two thirds of the family companies, uh, sorry, of the families that become wealthy tend to lose their wealth slowly. Another portion, I think about 20% lose it quickly. And then some, one out of six, one out of seven historically have regenerated their wealth, grown their wealth, and typically in some new ways in generations two, three, and four. Once you're on the regeneration path, you can always fall off, losing your wealth again quickly or slowly. But the idea is to get there and stay there. And we're gonna talk about how you do that. One of the lessons of doing that is that not surprising, but it's difficult to get families to fully appreciate what this means. You need to continue to grow value generation over generation over generation and do that according to your values, your approach, your way of doing things. That's the game of long-term survival. And the type of value that you create needs to be, it's necessary, but not sufficient. It needs to, there needs to be enough financial value created to support the system, the, the enterprise, the business, and the other things that you want to support over time. But it turns out that financial value alone doesn't earn the commitment and the unity that families need to establish and grow over time. Other types of value, including social impact value, reputational value, relational value, alliances, quality of relationships in the family, et cetera, are also essential. And we'll talk about this. As you can tell so far, the formula of success is it's a complex one, but the rudiments as I would teach you are actually pretty straightforward. Now, the question and one of the questions we would explore together, which I've been exploring intensively is, well, I get historically how it works. And by the way, it wasn't clear to me in decade one or even decade two, really how it worked. I was getting it, but I didn't fully understand it. In decades three, more so in decade four, I can say that I, you can always learn new things, but I think I got it now. But what about this? Okay, but now we're going into a new age. We've entered a new age roughly from the year 2000 I'll explain why, uh, that is reshaping the terrain, the way the world works. And in fact, all of these various aspects, uh, this is the terrain that I look at of families and family enterprises. All of these aspects are in motion. Most of them are not only are in motion, but are changing in an accelerated way. And so if you're in this environment, have the rules of success changed? Well, understand what's producing the changes. And clearly everybody points to technology and it deserves to be recognized. But the big, 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 disruptor is at the top of this list, environmental degradation and occasional economic, ecological disruption like COVID-19. And an enormous disruptor, an enormous disruptor because it affected and was affected by all four of these forces that I follow. But there are a lot of socio-political economic changes and globalization. And we would explore and you would have a framework for understanding what is producing the level of change typically through the interaction of these four forces 
not any of them alone. Technological change, by the way, has been accelerated in its, in, in its use in the world because of globalization and because regulations permit it, or at least don't inhibit its spread. Now, on technology, no question that we've been through, we are in a new age, what's called 4.0. I'm sure you've been reading about it or, and experiencing it. And what historically, what has turned out to be true is that within any of these eras, after the, you know, the leap from one era to the other is disruptive typically. But within an era, family companies perform well and perform better. Going from one era to another, family companies perform worse. Why? Because they hang on to practices, to people, to technology longer than they should. And they adapt more slowly to big changes, although they adapt quite naturally and well to smaller changes and smaller uh, leaps because they are great innovators. So we're in a new technological era, but also an era uh, that is a combination of these four forces acting on, first of all, society, families, and businesses and family offices. And we would explore how the world is changing, morphing, and challenging both your family and your family enterprise. So not only is the terrain different, but things have speeded up. Life, work, and decision-making is faster today than ever before. And I can tell you from a personal perspective, having been in the trenches with families and family businesses and family offices, that that is, it, it feels faster. So the pace of almost everything is accelerating and windows of opportunity are closing faster, meaning you don't have as much time anymore to either invest in a new opportunity or solve a problem before it gets worse. And the world is much, much less predictable today. Uh, you don't know where the next big idea, challenge or opportunity is going to come from and you don't have a lot of time to figure it out. So the question is in this environment, in this kind of quickly changing but unpredictable environment, in what we call a VUCA world, and I'm sure you've heard that term. If you haven't heard it, learn it. It's great to use at cocktail parties. The world is volatile, uncertain, complex, more ambiguous, foggy, and so our ability to predict, number one, and then adapt, number two, is less. And added to all of this on the business side, the change in these global forces, the acceleration of life in the business world and in society has also been impacting, stimulating industries to change faster, mature faster, be more open to external entrance into the industry that can radically change and sometimes disruptively change the game you're playing. And when I say disruptive, it's a, it's a term that's overused. You would not overuse it with me but it's an important one to learn. And it has to do with things, new things happening that make what you're doing today obsolete or much less useful. So you will find, you know, the in disruption uh, that can threaten a, a business's viability because it, it forces a big change in one's business model and can even transform 
a society. Think of how COVID has called a halt to the way we were doing things last year and said, you're now gonna have to do some things differently. Forget the trips. You're gonna interact like this until I tell you it's okay to go out again. And society poorly performing on containing it, even though this is our fourth pandemic of this century. We should have had, and apparently the outgoing administration in the US had a pandemic plan that was shelved by the current administration, but other countries as well have done somewhat better to a lot worse in managing this thing. And we better get good at this because it's going to, this is not the last one. I think we can comfortably say, and the next one will probably be relatively soon. And so you need to be able to quickly, agilely move to a new way of doing things. Now, a disrupted industry, just to give you an example. You're in an industry like video rentals. I don't know if you remember them, I do. And then something happens, a technological breakthrough, but that is compatible with uh, consumers and society already being well-educated and comfortable in terms of streaming services that allowed the old, the, the trap door for the old industry just opened up and a new industry was born. That's disruption. Now, are there still some video stores? I've seen them, but they're not very popular. Uh, and most, to play the game, you had to move abruptly to a new way of delivering service. Those that did and could scale are around. Those that couldn't are not. So one of the things that I tell my clients and my students is that your core business, and you might have one, two, a few different industries that you're in. And so you could be positioned differently on this river, depending on the industry that you're in. You could be well upstream in water that is calm, or maybe it's moving pretty fast, or maybe you've gone through one rapid and you think that, wow, we survived, we're great, or maybe you're here. And the difficulty with waterfalls, the, speaking naturally and really here, is that most of the noise of a waterfall comes from the bottom of the waterfall. And so you typically don't hear much of it until you're in the rapids when it's very hard to get out. And most family companies that I work with, I ask them all the time, tell me where you are. And most of them picture themselves up river and I don't. So we need to get into a frame of mind if you're going to be an owner and especially a leader in a family company of realistic assessment of what's going on around you and in your industry. That's an important development that family business management fundamentally appreciates because you're <laughs> the only rational uh, thing to say today is that yes, this can and probably will happen to us. And our job is to figure out how to, re how to respond, how to adapt not, aren't, we're going to be the lucky ones. No, we're not. And in fact, you need to be able to do these things. You need to be able to anticipate change, get oriented to change your organization frequently, become agile in terms of trying new things, financially stable, which family companies tend to be long-term, check, persistent, check, realistic, not so much. And as the new generation of family business owners and leaders, you need to develop 
an owner's mindset, one that it can understand what's going on around your company, be able to think and rethink and recalibrate your business model, rethink even the mission that you're on, to become more experimental, to let go of things that aren't working, something that historically families are terrible at, and develop a change-oriented culture. So getting altitude, understanding about value creation, and understanding how to develop an agile organization, all things that you would learn at MIT Sloan. And be able to, at the same time, to de develop and support an owner's mindset along with a concern about operational excellence. That's the name of the game today. To become a really strong owner's mindset leader, you need to develop these four skills. It's not enough to become a good operational manager. It's not enough to know how to innovate. Very important to know, but it's not enough. You need to be able to gain and use an owner's mindset and become good at these four things if you're gonna survive well in the new environment. And in the things that we would do as we think about your path to become effective in your family company, we would be teaching you. You would be learning about ownership, industries, how to change, learning about portfolio strategy, preparing to be an active owner and able to make these four bets, these four kinds of bets on capital, people, uh, culture, and governance that are key to the future. So uh, I hope that was a useful, probably very quick, probably very, um, ho but hopefully not rushed, uh, overview of what my interests and the, the topic of family business or family enterprise management entails. And so with that, uh, and almost on time, Anne, I'm going to come back to you. And uh, here, I could see that some hands were going up as, as I was talking, that's a good thing. And um, let's, let's hear their question. Okay. Thank you, that was wonderful. So we have a lot of questions coming in. I'll get to as many as we can, um, but from your background and experience, are there any specific family relationships that tend to be more successful than others when starting a business? For example, do spouses tend to be more successful than siblings? Uh, I, it's, it's a bit rusty now, but um, a couple of, Gener a couple of generations, a couple of decades ago, when I was um, really studying work relationships between relatives. And I wrote my dissertation, by the way, in 1982, that's when it was published, on father-son work relationships. Why father-son? There are a lot of them. And there were hardly any father-daughter relationships back then. Now, thankfully, that's changed. There are also mother-son, mother-daughter, um, and and they've all, there have always been uh, spouse relationships in uh, family companies. So I've, but relying on past data, but also my appreciation for how spousal relationships have changed and changed dramatically in the last couple of decades. At least they're trying to change. There are a lot of historical uh, patterns in spousal relationships that it turns out it's pretty tough to change. Like women tend to do a lot more uh, at home and a lot more for the couple than the men do. Uh, that tends to not, that's kind of, we're working that one out. But um, spouses tend to have 
in my research, yes, a better relationship than siblings on average. And they're good and bad ones, of course, in both camps. But why? Because spousal relationships, which tend to be very, you, you bring into a spousal relationship, a lot of, uh, I'm trained as a psychologist, a lot of your, your own projections of, of, uh, that you place on each other, uh, of things that you want in a relationship. Uh, so there can be a lot of added tension because of that mechanism, but it's choiceful. It's a choiceful relationship and it's more negotiable what you each do to contribute and support. So for those reasons, it tends to be a little bit more, if you're looking at averages, a little bit more successful. Siblings tend to have wired into them uh, a natural um, support mechanism out of uh, sincere feeling, but also obligation, and also a, um, some rivalry often built in, and a lot of historical understandings of one another that tend to be, sorry to say, very difficult to change um, as, they, as siblings get older. So short answer, siblings do a little better. I'm sorry, spouses do a little better than siblings. They're both complicated. Um, I hope that helps. Great, excellent. Uh, do you have any top indicators that you would suggest that it's time to transition from one generation or family member to another other than age? Yeah, um, <clears throat> this is a great one. We'll explore this one um, in some detail. Uh, the it used to be, I used to advocate that succession transition should happen this couple generations, a couple decades ago, 1990s, 2000s, early. Well, when the senior person is ready, that's the safest time because he typically, he or she will start to pull back, will leave openings, will bring into responsibilities others more naturally. I don't say that anymore. Why? Because uh, the momentum that you need to encourage, enforce in organizations to keep up the pro forward progress demands rather constant innovation, change, forward movement. And so if you, if you delay the timing of succession too much, not only does the next generation lose interest and they have more options today than they've ever had. So you have a greater risk of losing them, not to say they couldn't substitute for somebody else. And, but the organization can also slow down and become more vulnerable in this period of it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So what I tell families now is that you pass the baton when the next generation is ready to lead, L-E-A-D with a D, not when the senior generation is ready to leave with a V. And the driving logic behind that is the need for uh, higher levels of momentum to assure company survival. Great. We have a couple questions coming in about family members who are not interested in the business. How do you keep them engaged or manage conflict um, with their lack of interest? Yeah, great one. And uh, that's true in almost all families. That if you have, if there are three next generation members or four or two, not all of them typically go into the company. Uh, some will, some won't. And now they all may be owners and equal owners. So ownership, uh, having an ownership stake can, can motivate people to become active, committed, supportive. But very often we don't educate. So very often we don't even inform well the passive owners of a company and just expect them to go along because you're getting a dividend 
don't don't give me your opinions just i'll tell you when i want you to show up that tends to be an attitude a prevalent attitude terrible attitude counterproductive you know don't do it um but the non-active siblings or non-active cousins uh, often if they're not in the business and they could even be in business in some way or in some profession that could still add to uh, help support as a good owner, as a board member perhaps. But if they're not in a business um, field, no interest in finance, maybe even afraid of finance, no experience in real business, et cetera. What else in our family enterprise, not the company, maybe some of the stuff that the company is doing they're interested in, but what else? Could it be philanthropy or impact investing or some community program that the family, not necessarily the family company, but the family is engaged in. Now that's something I can help with. That's something that appeals to me. That's something that I can understand and I can be useful. I can be a contributor and I can gain a little status in my, in my family because the other characteristic that families show all the time is if you're in the business, you're somebody and if you're not in the business, you're not as good. You're not as interesting. You're not as valuable. You're nice. But, and families do that way too much. And so there tends to be often be the status differential between the siblings in the business and those out. And sometimes those out are doing very well for themselves, thank you very much, have very interesting lives and have things to contribute but families tend not to recognize them as much. And that higher status differential is, is of course tied into, related to having an operator's mindset. So Great. give so them something else to contribute to. That's excellent advice. I think we have time for one more question. And this is a large question that we've seen many people um, interested in, and it could take the whole semester to answer it. But how would one learn to manage conflict or complex family personalities um, and difficult relationships in making a business successful? Well, <clears throat> we will, when we talk about work relationships, we'll also be talking about conflict management. And there are things you can do to set up a situation so you have fewer incidents of conflict. Most conflict in families, by the way, I'm convinced, most, not all, is related to disrespectful behavior or feeling that you've been disrespected, whether the other person did it or meant it or whatever. But disrespect is an important, very prevalent condition in families with serious conflict. Uh, but there are other things as well, but setting up a situation so that you, there's less of it and you've got some methods to manage it uh, is really useful, including um, some mechanisms to ensure that you're talking enough, mechanisms to assure that you're showing respectful behavior and mechanisms to intercept conflict before it escalates and conflict in families tends to escalate. Um, but then we also uh, would cover what you can do when it appears, because it will appear from time to time. And whether it's interpersonal or intergroup conflict, uh, whether it's historically based or based on something that's going on now that we're, we're opposed on, it all matters. So being able to understand it, learning to talk your way into conversations that can help simmer down the conflict and get people to approach and problem solve is really the key. And, and you're right that this is something, it's a broader topic, but there are, there are ways of dealing with this and ways that we would um, uh, instruct you on. 
Great. Before we wrap up, um, does we've seen just so many more questions on family members versus non-family members who are involved in the company and talent development. Is this something that your course will talk about and in, in making sure that those who are not part of the family are growing and thriving? Yes. And uh, it related to this, but yes, dealing with the non-family employee group, an essential component of company success and establishing a professional environment for all employees, whether they're family or non-family, is, is one of the keys. And we will talk about what does it mean to be professional and have a professional culture? What are the ingredients in a professional culture? And how do you build inside the company uh, what I call a tribal identity? Uh, whether you're family or non-family. So you really feel like you're part of the same team uh, and, and exposed to the same incentives and, the, and you know, uh, trying to achieve the same mission, uh, all part of it. And yes, we will talk about it. Thank you. Great, great question. Great. Any final words um, before we end today's wonderful session? I, you know, as a relative newcomer to MIT and MIT Sloan, always, even down the river when I was teaching at Harvard Business School for those 21 years, um, had friends at MIT, looked down at MIT, highly regarded MIT. But I'll tell you, I, I regard this school even more highly being on the inside of it and understanding the, not just the, you know, it's known for a kind of like this intellectual horsepower, all true, uh, but the experimental nature at MIT and the social conscience of MIT, and I'm talking mostly about the business school that I know, but I've heard that this is true more broadly, and the, the sense of commitment to, um, building progressive enterprise and entrepreneurship and creativity, uh, you're going to love it. It's really a fun place to learn. Well, thank you for that. And thank you all for attending. I know you mentioned uh, your work with Jason, Jason Jay. He will be wrapping up our faculty series spotlight next week. So please join us for that yeah. as well. But um, thank you, Professor Davis. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we all hope you are well and healthy during these challenging times. And we hope to see you virtually again and hopefully someday in person at MIT Sloan. Definitely. So You're going to you love so Jason Jay. By the yeah, way. he's That's wonderful. Thank you. And this recording will be available on our admissions YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. And Professor Davis, thank you again. This was fascinating. Take My care, great everyone. pleasure. Thank you, Ann. Thanks for the invitation. Good luck to you all.